among the people I know who have heard about it, needle binding or null binning is often associated with early Iron Age and Viking Age. But some regions in Norway have retained a continuous tradition of the craft at least since then, which how many crafts can boast of an unbroken tradition of a thousand years or more? I think that's pretty neat. I thought we would take inspiration from some of the later artifacts for this one, such as this rather impressively embellished mitten bought by a parish priest in 1877, at which point it was said to already be 150 years old, making it early 18th century. We also know they came from Hitterdal in Telemark, and since needle binding stitches are often named from the region or archaeological site they were first recorded from, I want to try my hand at the Telemark stitch for this one, which I have never done before. The wool I'm using is this lovely naturally pigmented wool from the Pelsse, or one of the Norwegian short-tailed land races. This one is from the series Varde from Hillesvog and is a lovely medium weight. You know I love a good project that requires a minimal amount of tools, so let us finish winding up these skeins and get straight to it. Alright, so if you have never seen needle binding until now, I'm going to try to do a tiny bit of a crash course. So uh, we have our needle, which is a fairly large needle that is nice to grip with. It can also be a smaller needle, so you know, if you have a big darning needle that will work. These are especially good for York stitch and other stitches where you use the needle as a gauge rather than your thumb. So you have your needle and you have a finite amount of thread. You see it's only connected to my piece that I'm working on, so you'll need to keep splicing new yarn as you work, which I'm going to show you how to do a little later. Now the stitch that a lot of us start with, it looks like something like this. You have the last stitch on your thumb, and you pick up one or maybe two, depending on the stitch, stitches from the work below. Of course you discard this if you're still working on the first loop and then you go through one or two loops on the back. These are your previous stitches and then you go through one or two of your thumb loops. So whether it is one or two here, one or two here, or one or two here, that's going to determine the name of the stitch, be it Mammon stitch, Oslo stitch, or a lot of those other. And this is generally based on where they were found and what archaeological site. And then the new one just gets put on your thumb and your thumb is your gauge. So with that, you will always have stitches that are the same size. Contrast that with the Telemark stitch, which was the one I wanted to learn to do for this video. Just thread my needle here. So this one is a little bit different. You still have the thumb loop, but if you can see, it's very much thinner. And part of that has to do with the twist. So here you have to go, I still pick up two stitches. I like to do that to keep my work nice and narrow. But you have to go from the back just because of the way this stitch works. And then the previous loop and the second previous loop, but then you twist it and then you go through the thumb loop, but over the yarn and then you need to squeeze this or you end up with a little bit of puckering on the back. Now that you know everything you need, let us make some mittens. I start by making a few loops around my fingers that I twist into a figure eight, but you can start in many different ways. One of the nice things about needle binding is that since you're going all the way through the stitch, unlike knitting and crochet, you are making a series of knots rather than loops. 
So if the beginning looks wonky and the rest is possible, you can carefully unpick the beginning without it affecting the rest of the work. The extra twist of each stitch makes the work painfully slow. I feel like a beginner again compared to my usual speed, but I really do love the end result of this stitch. I know I am not showing you other stitches to compare with, but look at how little twist is in the Telemark stitch when laid flat. Makes it so easy to connect the first stitch and turn this into a loop. And then we just continue. I want my mittens to taper slightly towards the wrist for a better fit. I do this by skipping a stitch when connecting to the previous round. Less really is more here. I am taking in my work no more than two to three times per round, checking as I go. I had a tendency to overdo it in the past and it is one of the fastest ways to make things look wonky. As for splicing our yarn when we run out, this is usually done with a spit splice. Simply split both ends of the yarn you wish to splice. Twist them together and... Apply moisture before rubbing vigorously between both palms to felt our wool together. I have heard that the enzymes in spit may help with the felting, but I'm not entirely sure that is not just a myth. I also feel the need to point out that nearly all needle binding instructors I have overheard advise their students to work with a single arm's length of yarn at a time to make things easier for themselves. And yet every single needle binder I know disregards that advice in their own work, me included. But if you find yourself with an unreasonably large amount of yarn, it may help to fold the end double like you see me doing here, and then readjust as your thread grows shorter. Back in the day, at least as far back as medieval times, mittens like these, although much more lavishly embroidered than I have the skill to do, could be part of the gifts given between the two betrothed people in the time before the wedding, to show off the skills and knowledge you brought with you into the marriage. Other common gifts could be knitted, woven or sewn goods for the other person, handmade tools for their crafts, or valuables like silver and imported fabrics like silk shawls. It was even tradition in some regions to meet the accompanying family visiting for the betrothal discussions with indifference and even send them away before welcoming them properly and celebrating with food and ale for everyone. Once I've reached the wrist, I take out my work again to accommodate the thumb just as slowly and carefully as I reduced it this time by picking up the same stitches twice from the previous row. A visit by the local wool inspector is sure to improve the quality of the work. Thank you. 
and a little fit test to see if we've reached the point where the thumb splits from the hand yet. When it does, I stop connecting my stitches to the previous row for an inch or two until we have a strip long enough to comfortably fit our thumb through. We then reconnect our stitches and keep going up the rest of the hand. I'm also decreasing my work slightly as I work my way to the top of the fingers here, just when I notice it is getting quite a lot wider than the hand it is supposed to envelop. Once we reach the top of the fingers, I start to decrease in earnest, taking in every stitch until there is just a small hole left. My large U-needle is far too big for this last part, so to stitch up the hole and weave in my end, I am swapping for my much smaller bone needle. And while we're at it, why not weave in the end for our starting thread too? Last up, we have the thumb. The main thing to be aware of here is that the corners can get a bit drafty if you pick up just the top stitches. So I pick up stitches a little further in as well, just there. After the first round, I reduce the number of stitches quite aggressively until it fits but is not tight. It is always nice to remember that it is the air between the wool fibers that is doing the job of insulating our fragile human skin from the mercurial ways of the weather. But a body part that is wrapped too tightly will not just have less insulating air around it, it will also be harder to get a good blood flow circulating through it, leaving you cold despite layers and layers of wool. Stay warm out there, friends. And we finish up the thumb just like we did the main body, by reducing our stitches drastically and then sewing up the last remaining hole before weaving in the end. The inside thread too, of course. And there you have one pair of winter worms that can be made with nothing more than a needle and thread. Warmer than you think, and in a pattern that will leave a lot of people guessing. I hope you are dressed for the weather wherever you are. Many thanks to my lovely Patreons for continuing to enable me in these experimental shenanigans, and until next time. <laughs> Der satt der ei kroke i lunden og gul Hei fara, feltur, yltur, alt ura Og mannen han snudde om hesten sin Hei fara, om hesten sin Så kjørte han heima til garen igjen Hei fara, feltur, yltur, alt ura Men kroka kom etter på taket og gol Hei fara på taket og gol Og mannen
en hand opp gjennom jorden for Hei fara, falter helt ur alt ur av Og mannen han spende sin båge for kne Hei fara, sin båge for kne Så skøt han den kråka så hod opp ned Hei fara, falter helt ur alt ur av Og kjøttet han saltet i tynner og fat Hei fara, i tynner og fat Og tunga han brukte til julemat Hei fara, falter helt ur alt ur av Og den som kjekker råka kan nyta så Hei fara, kan nyta så 